So we are going to move on to our last presentation of the day, uh, which will be from Dr. Kim from Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and she will be speaking to us about neurodevelopmental testing in adrenal leukodystrophy. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I am just going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, Um, good afternoon. I'm by no means an expert and I'm still learning, but so thank you so much for giving me time to kind of talk about neurodevelopmental testing in patients with adrenal leukodystrophy. Um, again, my name is Aram Kim. I am a fifth year resident. I'm a neurodevelopmental disabilities resident at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and I'm currently spending some time at the program for the study of neurodevelopment and rare disorders um, at our hospital. And so I wanted to kind of start with a brief overview about what we know um, when it comes to neurodevelopment and in patients patients with adrenal leukodystrophy, um, and maybe some brief comments about newborn screening and MRIs in um, this patient cohort. And then I was going to just review some data that we found in our cohort of patients at the NDRD. So just to kind of review, um, as many of the audience knows, um, neurodevelopment refers to the brain's development and maturation of pathways that influences our performance and function. And again, as many of the people in the audience know that we know that patients with cerebral ALD, their less score is associated with neurocognitive function. And specifically, it's been shown that there is a significant association with pre-transplant less scores and baseline verbal comprehension perceptual reasoning and processing speed. It's also very well established that a lower pre-transplant less score, and in the literature, a lot of the times the cutoff between nine and 10 is used, and better pre-transplant neurologic function plays a role in overall survival, um, neurologic function, and risk of disease progression post-transplant. And more specifically, uh, Beam and colleagues showed that pre-transplant less scores correlates with post-transplant cognitive and motor development, and that a combined nonverbal spatial ability with nonverbal IQ and less scores can be also a strong predictor of um, outcome post-transplant. Additionally, I think this was mentioned earlier, um, uh, Pierpont and colleagues also showed that even in a group of individuals thought to be of standard risk, so a less score uh, less than 10, even if these patients received transplant, several years post-transplant, they can still show impairments in processing speed, um, sustained attention, and visual motor integration with individuals with less scores greater than four and a half showing higher percentage of these um, impairments. And more recently, the same group um, reviewed individuals with a less score less than five and compared neurocognitive findings pre and post transplant. They took the group um, who had a less score less than five and split them up between 0.5 and two and a less score of two and a half and 4.5 and showed that both groups scored pretty similarly in neurocognitive testing pre-transplant Transplant in all the domains that were tested. There were no overt abnormalities on um, pre-transplant, but two years post-transplant, the group with the higher less score performed worse on tests that evaluated for processing speed and fine motor dexterity and to a lesser degree visual motor integration. Um, the group found uh, that verbal reasoning skills, working memory, and verbal comprehension remained relatively stable. And additionally, the same group found that patients with the higher less scores, so again, between two and a half and four and a half, also developed more attention issues and hyperactivity both at baseline and post transplant. And so this is the figure that um, was in the paper that I just kind of um, spoke about. As you can see on the x-axis, you have the pre-transplant MRI severity that goes up to five that's plotted against the two-year um, uh, post-transplant uh, neurocognitive domain that they measured. Um, and they kind of have it very well uh, laid out, whereas uh, the white in the graph is going to be um, the average range um, and the light gray is going to be below average and then the dark gray is going to be severe impairment um, in those neurocognitive domains. So when you look at verbal reasoning, visual reasoning, and working memory, you can see that um, uh, based on the pre-transplant MRI severity, uh, the prediction is, that, is such that not really uh, um, that the pre-transplant MRI severity uh, is going to predict or um, 
is a predictor of, of the two-year neurocognitive domain, whether it be verbal reasoning, visual reasoning, um, and working memory. So they uh, remain pretty stable, whereas in processing speed, fine motor dexterity, and to a lesser degree, visual motor integration, you see that dip into um, the below average range. Um, Therefore, there's a narrow window when transplant would be optimal, especially um, since our goals are going to be to prevent any neurocognitive and especially because we know that transplant, uh, late transplant can also accelerate disease. So making early detection of patients who are at risk for uh, developing cerebral disease um, are important, especially in the context of newborn screening, as we detect more patients that are at risk. And I just wanted to uh, plug in a, a little bit about neuroimaging and ALD. Um, I think this was spoken about earlier, um, especially because there was a recent consensus, consensus paper published with guidelines on MRI surveillance. Um, so I'll just go over it really quickly just in case anyone missed it. And so it's recommended that the first MRI be done without contrast between 12 to 18 months. And the second be done 12 months after the first um, without contrast between the age of 24 to 30 months. Um, like it was mentioned earlier, um, between the ages of three and 12 years is the highest kind of likelihood that a patient with ALD can develop cerebral um, disease. So recommend that MRI scans done with contrast every six months with the recommendation that if any point in early stage uh, lesion is detected, that they be referred to a center with expertise in caring for patients with ALD and a repeat MRI be done with contrast in three months. Um, and of course, if there's any gadolinium enhancing lesion, um, that the patient be referred to a transplant center um, or for transplant referral. And so they also recommended as uh, lesions, especially uh, those patients with the low LUS score can be very subtle. Uh, general anesthesia is recommended until a child can lay still for an MRI. And so especially with the more recent uh, data and studies on neurodevelopment in children with cerebral disease, we know that the window for intervention for optimal outcomes is, uh, can be very slim. Um, the addition of um, ALD to the newborn screen is no doubt extremely important, but as more and more children are screened uh, positive for being at risk for ALD, more children are inevitably gonna undergo monitoring and new challenges uh, will certainly arise, especially as there's no real clear genotype phenotype correlations dictating kind of who will develop cerebral disease and who will not. And so again, there's no question um, the role that MRIs play in monitoring children at risk for cerebral disease and detecting cerebral disease, um, but other measures can, may also be helpful for risk stratification, such as neurocognitive profiles that may help us understand if certain patients are at a higher risk for developing cerebral disease or not. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it's been shown that individuals with the lower less scores don't necessarily show any overt abnormalities on neurocognitive testing initially, um, but we still sought to better understand if there's any certain patterns that can be seen on detailed neurocognitive testing in individuals um, with cerebral disease. And so how we went about doing that was looking at the cohort of ALD patients who have cerebral disease um, and doing a retrospective description. And we looked at our natural history studies um, and we also looked at who we deemed to have kind of early cerebral disease patients with a less score less than nine and who wasn't transplanted at that time. Um, I do wanna say that most of the patients um, that are in our natural history study and this kind of early cerebral ALD who are deemed with early cerebral ALD did end up receiving a transplant. Um, and so the neurodevelopmental testing that um, we focused on is the differential ability scales and the beery bactonica developmental test of visual motor integration. And so I just wanted to say a couple words about the neurodevelopmental testing that we used. So the differential ability scales is used to test for cognitive abilities. Um, there's an early years test and a school age test. Both of them um, have a subtest, have subtests of verbal ability, nonverbal reasoning and spatial ability and both come, um, outcomes can be uh, given as an age equivalent or standard scores. Um, and also the beery bactonica developmental test of visual motor integration can be used in kids two years and up. And there are subtests for fine motor coordination and visual perception. And there's a separate subtest for the beery VMI score, which kind of integrates um, the two fine motor coordination and visual perception together. And those you can also get as an age equivalent and standard scores. So I thought this was a good graph to kind of start with. This has been published before um, by Beam and colleagues, um, uh, but we just updated kind of our um, 
patient kind of cohort in this. As you can see, this is gonna be cognitive age equivalent in patients that were transplanted based on the less scores. Um, down on the x-axis, um, just to orient everyone, is gonna be the calendar age in years. And then on the y-axis is gonna be developmental age in years. Um, there's gonna be those two outer lines in the middle of the graph that encompasses 95% of typically developing children in the general population, um, with the mean being in the middle. And each individual dot is a separate patient and those dots that are connected with lines are basically uh, different measurements um, over time of the same patient. Um, and as you can see, the blue are patients who got transplanted with a less score less than nine. And then the red is gonna be patients who are transplanted with a less score greater or equal to nine. And most of this is post-transplant data. And as you can see, as we all know, um, there is uh, very much a clear distinction of patients who get transplanted when their less score is lower when compared to higher. And so I kind of wanted to go and start um, with the verb, uh, age equivalence of verbal ability in our patients. And so to better understand how neurodevelopment is altered in cerebral disease more specifically, we looked again at our cohort of patients who received the DOS and who didn't receive any intervention at the time and um, sought to see patterns of differences in their verbal, nonverbal, and spatial abilities. And so we'll start with verbal ability here. Um, again, it's a very similar graph than the one uh, shown prior. And you can see that um, there are individual dots, which are individual time points of patients. Um, and I just wanted to say, as I mentioned before, we do have limited longitudinal data since those of those patients that had a less score warranting transplant received transplant in a timely manner. And those um, who had a less score that was higher than recommended for transplant um, declined um, as one can expect relatively rapidly, and um, many of them were lost to follow up and didn't get repeat testing. Um, and I have to say that a lot of these patients did end up receiving transplant. But as you can see here, um, they're all of the blue dots being individual patients, you can see a lot of them kind of stay within the two outer lines of expected development. There are a cohort of patients who are kind of skirting on um, um, below, but when compared to the age equivalence of spatial ability, I think you can appreciate that there, um, are a larger number of patients who uh, tended to score better on their verbal ability compared to their ability. Um, there's a cohort of patients between like ages six to 12 years um, that kind of lay below that uh, uh, second line on the bottom, um, showing that they are outside of the realm of what we expect to be typical development and scoring lower on their spatial ability. Um, I don't think that this is necessarily all that surprising because um, it's been shown that patients who are transplanted, even with a relatively low less score, um, they can develop deficits in fine motor and uh, uh, visual motor integration, which are kind of skills that are tested when it comes to the spatial ability on the DOS testing. Next, we're going to kind of move on to nonverbal ability. And I think this is a little bit less compelling when it terms uh, in terms of um, kind of looking at if there's any differences. Um, I think that that um, is a lot more compelling when looking at spatial ability. But I do think that generally a lot of our patients kind of scored within that two outer lines. And there's just a smaller cohort of patients who did maybe a little bit worse on nonverbal ability. And those patients did tend to have um, worse uh, imaging findings on their MRI. And then now skipping over to uh, the visual motor integration. And so um, this is gonna be the same graph um, as we've uh, been seeing before, but now looking at the VMI testing and specifically the visual percep perception subtest. As you can see, um, there are a good amount of patients that are kind of lying within the two outer lines. There are the cohort of patients who kind of lie um, outside of typical development. Um, but when compared to fine motor coordination, um, I think you can see that there are a larger number of patients who are scoring below expected uh, development um, when it comes to fine motor coordination. In fact, there's only one patient who's scoring kind of above the 50th percentile and the rest of the patients are scoring below the 50th percentile, which was unlike uh, what we found in visual perception and very similarly kind of skipping over to the visual motor integration, um, Again, I think it's much more compelling that patients are scoring uh, lower than expected um, in their spatial, oh, sorry, in their fine motor coordination when compared to their visual motor integration. And so just to kind of sum it up, um, when comparing um, 
the motor coordination versus visual perception in our patient cohort. And this um, was done using standard scores. And I just wanted to kind of depict the data with uh, age equivalent, just because it was a little bit easier to see um, their development and the progression on, of the uh, patient's development and progression. You can see that there was a statistically significant difference in our uh, natural history group, group um, when it comes to motor coordination versus visual perception, and also motor coordination versus visual motor integration. Um, there was no statistical difference between Motor, uh, visual motor integration and visual perception. And um, we thought that we saw a pattern with spatial scores being lower than verbal scores, um, but that was not statistically significant. Um, but with all of this kind of in mind, um, we wanted to see if there was a similar pattern that could be found in patients with what we considered early cerebral disease, again, a less score less than nine. And so we can jump over to that. as my PowerPoint can be. Okay, there we go. Um, and so just to orient everyone on the bottom X axis is gonna be age and years. And then on the uh, Y axis here, we're looking at standard scores with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Um, again, very, very small sample size. I don't think that I can make any conclusions, but there's a couple of things that I wanted um, to kind of illustrate. And the average less score in this patient uh, uh, cohort is going to be 2.7. And so the blue dot is going to represent the verbal abilities and the red triangle, the spatial abilities, and the yellow square, the nonverbal abilities. And I just want to draw everyone's attention to that second column to the left. Um, I apologize, my mouse isn't working. Um, and so that patient does not have cerebral disease, um, but has a very similar neurocognitive profile as um, what I'm describing now. So I just put him in for illustrative purposes. We're just following him very closely. But I think that you, know, you can see a pattern of patients having um, lower spatial abilities, which is that red triangle when compared to the uh, blue dot, which is the verbal abilities. Again, also barring that first patient who kind of had it flip-flopped. And again, all of these patients, except for that second patient, ended up getting transplanted. And then this is going to be uh, when looking at um, the visual motor integration test. Um, very similar graph um, with the uh, x-axis being age and years and the y-axis being standard score. Um, and the blue dot here is going to be visual perception. And then the red is going to be nation. And I apologize, um, the yellow square is going to be the Beery VMI score on that subtest. Um, and so if you look here, it's, it's a bit of a smaller uh, sample size. The average less score here is going to be a one. Um, but I think the pattern that I wanted to just illustrate here, again, no conclusions could be made, obviously, is that um, patients tended to have worse motor coordination um, skills when compared to their visual perception skills, which is something that we found statistically significant um, in our natural history group as well. And so, as mentioned earlier, it's been shown that children who have cerebral disease, even when transplanted with a lower less score and when clinically asymptomatic can still develop neurocognitive deficits two years post-transplant, making it imperative to ensure that timely diagnosis and intervention occurs for ideal. So, we saw find a cognitive pattern or profile in patients who are asymptomatic to possibly help us with risk stratification. Um, in our natural uh, history cohort, we found that there was a statistically significant difference between fine motor coordination versus visual perception and the Beery VMI score. Um, and we thought we saw an indication where these patients also had lower spatial skills than verbal skills. And again, though it was an extremely small sample size, um, patients who were otherwise asymptomatic with a low less score showed a similar profile on detailed neurocognitive testing. I apologize, it seems like my PowerPoint is stuck again. But just to kind of keep talking through, um, I think it's gonna be important going forward to try to better understand um, the relationship between spatial skills and verbal skills um, in this cohort. And also um, we wanted to look at our transplanted cohort to see if um, 
we're seeing similar kind of neurocognitive profiles and to better understand, you know, what are the risk factors that lend patients to have this neurocognitive profile or their associations with MRIs and things like that. And I think another important point, of course, is that as we pick up more patients through newborn screening, um, these patients, um, as we follow them, the patients who have similar neurocognitive profiles, are they at an increased risk of developing um, cerebral disease or not, I think is also an interesting question that we want to answer um, going forward. Um, I apologize, my PowerPoint is stuck, um, but I just wanted to thank um, Dr. Marie Escalar and Dr. Michelle Poe um, for supporting me through this talk, and then also the NDRD staff and patients who without them, um, I would not have been able to give this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kim. We do have some questions in the chat, um, and I believe Dr. Escalar did answer a few of them, but I'm still going to ask them just in case you did want to add anything more. Of course, I will do my best to answer them. <laughs> okay, uh, from Katie Becker, can the transplant alone account for any of this? Do you see changes in children going through transplant for other reason? I always wonder what impact the chemotherapy alone could potentially have. Um, I think I can try to answer that question. We know that um, some patients, especially when they're transplanted late, um, can have a progression of their disease. And so I think it really depends on what disease states that they're in when they get transplanted. Um, and most of the data that I've presented here today are uh, mostly pre-transplant kids or not, I shouldn't say pre-transplant. There are patients who didn't get any uh, bone marrow transplant. And so um, the patients that I presented here today, they would not have received that intervention. I don't know if I answered that question. I think so. Um, another thing I'd like to do, because we are getting a lot of questions about um, just kind of, you know, what the outcomes could be. Mm -hmm. And um, we do have a mom on Jill Smith who uh, just shared a little bit about her son is doing. Jill, do you want to say what you uh, what you typed in? I agree with you. I think it's important that people hear. Of course. Hey, um, I guess I just you know I I know the reality of the disease and it's horrific, but I would just like to say that. Um, because I think it's important for parents whose kids are found late and for newborn screen parents that my son Grady was diagnosed in 2018 with a less score of 10. And the first doctor wasn't going to do anything and um, Florian and his team transplanted him. Um, he's had zero progression. He is in fourth grade and just tested um, end of sixth grade reading, mid fifth grade math. Um, he is very talented in sports. He plays grades above him. And um, his main deficit is auditory processing, but he's actually gone from 2% blind speech to with one word to 90% full sentence blind speech with auditory retraining um, that he's been working really hard on. And he does obviously have processing issues and he is a little bit different than he was in the beginning, but there's also kids that are further along that are doing amazing like him. And there are other kids that have higher or less scores are doing amazing like him. So I don't want parents to lose hope and think that just because their kids have a higher or less score that it's an end all be all because I think it really depends on the kid or child themselves. Um, like Eric said er earlier, where, where the lesion is and it's just not across the board. I mean, I know it kind of is, but um, there is hope and kids that are further along can do very, very well. And there's so many things out there now that you just have to find and push for in it. Just want to throw that in there because I don't want people to think it's just you hear this and you hear this horrible thing that it's just going to be awful. There's good stories too. I agree. And, Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And I, I, I'm glad you said it because it leads into actually to our next question from Susan Marks, which is, do you think that there is a place for occupational therapy and vision therapy for these children? Um, so I am... I might be a little biased also, but as like a neurodevelopmental disabilities resident who sees kids who not only have, you know, um, neurodegenerative diseases, but also a gambit of other um, like neurodevelopmental diseases like autism spectrum disorder, I am a huge proponent of therapy. Um, I always say, try it and see how the kid responds to it and how they do, you know, um, and I think that's really, really important. And so long story short, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
we have a question from Dr. Inglesias. Which will be the more sensitive domain to assess what time of therapies will be indicated, how early and how often? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to answer that. I don't know that I can answer that just with the data that we have currently, but I do think that um, uh, the Minnesota group also found that visual motor integration, although probably not as much as, you know, um, processing speed um, um, and nonverbal uh, abilities, but I think that is an um, area that we're trying to look in, um, into a lot just because we found a pretty significant difference in our kids um, for that, at least in our natural history group. And so um, I think like spatial abilities and visual motor integration a lot, um, especially the fine motor dexterity is gonna be important to look at. Um, in terms of how often to test the kids, I think multiple factors kind of come into play. Um, some kids, you know, um, a lot of the kids kind of learn the test. We've certainly had that um, sometimes in our population where, you know, they seem to have learned the test and so they score a lot higher than they typically do. And so, um, I think keeping that in mind is gonna be important. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the optimal interval is in terms of how frequently we would test them in terms of uh, neurocognition. Um, am I missing another question? Um, I don't think so, that answers that. Jill, if you wanna take a look in the chat, everyone's thanking you for sharing your story. And Susan says, thank you, I'm a mom and an OT and I think that parents don't know that there are therapies available. So thank you, Susan, for that question. Katie Becker, just to add what Jill said, less score is only one thing to consider. Yes, uh, Dr. Escalar had mentioned this as well in the chat. We have to also consider what a kid looks like clinically at the time of diagnosis and what the baseline neuropsychological testing looks like. Uh, less is the easiest to study, but it is only one thing we consider at the time of diagnosis. Certainly. Okay, let's see. If bone marrow transplant performed with lowest possible score, is it possible to avoid neurocognitive deficits? I might have missed what. Sorry, I think the connection got a little spotty there. Is it possible to avoid any neurocognitive deficits um, if the bone marrow transplant is performed with a low score? Um, I think um, I think this was also answered by Dr. Malik um, earlier um, in terms of, I do think that it is, and it's certainly our hopes, right? I do think that it is possible that the earlier you do intervention when appropriate, that you um, prevent any neurocognitive deficits. And I think the um, initial data that the Minnesota group has um, put out does show that, you know, when you do it earlier with patients with, with a very low less score, and that's like the biggest thing they kind of, um, used as a kind of a predictor for uh, lack of a better term. And of course their baseline neurocognitive testing. Um, I do think that post-transplant, um, they also performed very well and within expectant range. So I think the answer to that is likely yes. Thank you. I know that's a, that's a big concern that's coming up a lot in the chat from a lot of our parents. I think that's why we keep seeing that. I think that's fair. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> right, I, I think. Jorosini says a possible takeaway seems like MRI scheduling may be dependent on where lesion is. Eric mentioned this is, a, you know, right, it's, it's real estate matters, as he said during his talk. And I believe that is all our questions that have come up. And we are at 358. So unless there's any other questions for Dr. Kim with the subject, I think we're going to close. Thank you so much for that presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. I think this is the point in the night where if we were all together in person, we would be going bowling. Right, Elisa? Exactly. Bowling and drinking. <laughs> so again, it's, it's a little different than past years, but we do want to thank everyone so much uh, for joining us today. We had great participation, great presentations, really great questions. And uh, with that, we will sign off and say we do look forward to seeing you tomorrow.